Well, isn't this sweet? Um, every week, uh, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ gather together in local churches all over the world to worship the Lord Jesus Christ collectively. And for a few brief hours, we get a step out of the world, gathering in fellowship with our brothers and sisters in Christ to hear the word of Christ proclaimed. Um, given the times that we live in, for believers in Christ, this is a sweet respite to our souls. And at the time of much needed encouragement, spiritual nourishment, equipping, and fellowship with one another. And it's also a time that we get to demonstrate our love for the Lord Jesus Christ and for his church as we gather in obedience to him. And when the church is functioning properly, this only serves to accentuate that sharp difference that exists between what takes place in here as a redeemed, gathered body and what is taking place out in the world. Um, if you can, you can begin turning in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. As we talk about this world, it is a dark place that we know where everyone is right in their own eyes. In Equipping Hour, we've been discussing injustice, wrong notions of justice. We also know this world has rival moral authorities and there's outright rejection of truth. Evil is called good. Good is called evil. But the Lord, through his apostle Paul, helps us remember that ever since man sinned, this is always the way the world has been. Consider his description of the world 2,000 years ago here in Ephesians 2. And you can just, we're just going to kind of scan over this section. You can see it in front of you, and we'll come back and hit a couple of the verses. But how does Paul describe the world here? How are the people described? The people are dead, unresponsive, prisoners, trapped in trespasses and sins in verse 1. They are walking according to the course of this world. That is, they follow the world's pattern and influence. And what is the pattern of the world? In the middle of verse 2, it's a pattern that follows after the prince of the air. That is, it is a satanic pattern. It's a pattern characterized by disobedience, at the end of verse 2. And those who, have, who follow in it have inherited all of the characteristics of their personified father, disobedience. How does this pattern manifest itself in the life of dead sinners? They live in their fleshly desires. That is, they are characterized by living within the confines of their evil fleshly desires. They can't escape those desires, nor do they want to. So what do they do with those desires that they can't escape? End of verse 3, they indulge those desires. They seek every opportunity to fulfill every desire of the mind and of the body, withholding no pleasure from themselves. And what does this pattern result in? End of verse 3, the wrath of God. That sounds like the world that we live in today. When speaking later in chapter 6 of Ephesians, of the conflict believers will face in the world, Paul says, beginning in verse 11, you don't need to turn there, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Why do we encounter opposition in this world as believers because the devil and the rulers in the heavenly places hate God and hate his followers. And those who are in the world are fully aligned with this system. They walk according to it, according to its ruler, the devil. And what Paul describes is the reality of what believers in Jesus Christ living in the world walk into every single day. A world of sinners enslaved to a deadly, satanic, evil, disobedient, pleasure-driven, lust-indulging system of darkness and wickedness. Right? So no wonder Sunday, being among God's people and worshiping him and hearing from in his word is such a sweet salve to the soul. Is that true for you? Does this reality not stoke your desire to be with God's people? But for followers of Jesus Christ, these descriptions of the world system and its, not, and its followers 
was not just given so we would know what we are up against. No, Paul reminds every believer of Jesus that these descriptions are autobiographical. Look back at verse 1 in chapter 2, written to believers. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Verse 2, you walked according to the course of this world. You walked according to the prince of the power of the air. You walked according to the spirit of disobedience. You formerly lived in the lust of the flesh. You indulged in the desires of the flesh. You were by nature children of wrath. You were in league with the forces of darkness and wickedness. But how did we escape? Verses 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgression, made us alive together with Jesus Christ. He gave us new life. We were once held in death and darkness, and he raised us up. He saved us, verse 8, by grace, through faith, as a gift of God. Why? Because he desired to show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Writing to the Colossian church in a similar vein, Paul writes, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In equipping hour this morning, we looked at those who are believers are no longer in darkness, but are sons of light. There are two types of people in this room, only two, dead in trespasses and sins and alive in Christ. Those who walk after the course of this world and those that follow Christ. Do you stand in amazement and gratitude of God's eternal plan to rescue sinners like you from the domain of darkness? Or are you still in darkness? If you're a believer, does God making you alive together with Christ, raising you from the dead, redeeming you, and forgiving your sins fuel your desire to worship with God's people? As we were reminded this morning, does this cause you to desire to abound still more and more in love for the, our fellow believers? Does God lavishing his kindness and mercy upon and grace upon you caused you to weep over those who are still enslaved by sin like we were and long for their salvation? Or do you find yourself increasingly distancing yourself from God's people, increasingly turning a deaf and dull ear to his word proclaimed and growing increasingly comfortable with what the world is and what it contains? If so, repent from that today. Renew your love and appreciation for your Lord Jesus Christ. In a few minutes, followers of Christ are going to be eating a piece of bread and drinking juice as we participate in our time of weekly communion. This is the time when we remember the broken body and blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, which secured the salvation of everyone who would put their faith in him. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, we'd ask that you do not take a communion package when they come by to pass them out, but we're glad that you're here because God is offering you this salvation today, this rescue from wrath. All mankind has sinned against God, and we've incurred a penalty that can never be satisfied by ourselves, but we were all born in debt, in trespasses and sin. We were all children of wrath by nature, but only by turning to follow Jesus and trusting in him alone with his death on the cross can God's wrath against your sin be satisfied. We plead with you, if you are not in Christ, turn to him today. We would love for you to speak with anyone you've seen up front here today or one of our pastors at the information table on your way out to, so you can learn more about what it means to receive the free gift of God, salvation. Men, in the back, you can go ahead and come forward and please serve us. Believers, remember Jesus while you take communion today. Remember what he has accomplished for you on your behalf. And when you are prepared, take communion on your own this morning.